Welcome to Pew Pew Panel with Chad and Ava. Today we're going to compare 22 WMR to 17 HMR. Let you all know if Chad's going to eat those spicy peppers and discuss all things food prepping. Uh, how are you doing today, Chad? Doing great. Thank you for asking. I, I love how awkward I sound when I'm like, uh, how are you doing? Because I'm so used to gun funny where I'm like, I'm your host, Abel Flannel. But I'm like, oh, yeah, I just I just introduced us. So I can't say that. Um, anyways, so really good news. Um, Gideon Optics. So they just sent me their new prism called the Advocate. And I was just messing around with it. I was just recording some content because, you know, as a content creator, you can never record enough content. It's like your whole life. Um, but I was just messing around with my Mantis, my Blackbeard X, and put the prism on my IWI Zion. And I got to say this prism. So for the longest time, it was like my go-to is the mediator for the red dot. But this prism is so fun. So I just recorded like a fun little video of me walking into my house and shooting all the cameras in my house, acting as though it was like an Airbnb and, you know, people are trying to get a little pervy. And um, just like, I don't know, like quick target acquisition is like just so easy. And then I also, what I noticed was uh, really easy is you guys can actually adjust if you have the Mantis, the Blackbeard. Um, you can adjust the laser. So if the laser, if you want it on the entire time, or if you just want it on when you pull the trigger, then it'll illuminate. But I kept it on the entire time while I sighted in my optic. And so I was like, cool, like don't even have to go to the range. Again, saving some money on ammo, although I, I am sponsored by Federal Humble Bag, but you know. Um, but yeah, this uh this prism is uh it's a freaking awesome little like little optic so uh website it says versatile 1913 picatinny rail mount lightweight rugged aircraft grade aluminum housing etched reticle for liability and one to 20 mm prism scope which one is the mm is it millimeter that's millimeter okay i so didn't know if it one was, yeah, yeah that's a one power by 20 millimeter objective size prism gotcha okay well, it's also it's on sale right now, two twenty nine. It's normally two ninety nine, which is a hell of a deal. But yeah, I, I think I'm gonna contact Gideon and be like, I want more of these to put them on all my optics. It was just really fun to use. The prisms are great because they're like an actual true one power. You know, you don't get yeah. that fish eye through them, and the etch reticles are great because technically they can't really fail. They're not like a wire mm -hmm. reticle. Um, so I don't know the prisms that we've played with before. They've been, um, you yeah, know, pretty stellar, especially at the price. You just can't beat it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. got that kind of ACOG kind of flair for, you know, not ACOG money, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. So guys, check it out. GideonOptics.com. Mm -hmm. All right. Today in a mail call, Chad, do you want to go first? Sure. I'll go first. So um, our buddies over at Armor Specialties sent us a suppressor to play with. So this is uh, the Aspect 30 from Armor Specialties. They're out of Halifax, uh, Pennsylvania. Halifax? Yes, Halifax. I have to double check to make sure that's right. This is a uh, kind of a classically styled monocore suppressor. Let me get it up here so okay. you can see. But unlike some of the other brands that, that are on the market. That noise, like when you're, that noise when you're unscrewing it. You know how some uh -huh. people bite their fork when they eat? Yeah, and it's like, oh, I hate when people do it. it's like nails on the top board. It kind of felt like Hard that. I was like, oh, okay. No. <laughs> I'll do it away from the mic next time. But this is a clamshell design monocore, so it's got, uh, you know, similar panels to like what you see on the uh, Silencer Co. Uh, the old Sparrow, I believe, is the suppressor. This is a monocore clamshell design. Maybe wrong, but simple monocore construction. But the clamshell helps keep the carbon off of the tube, which is one uh, downside to most monocore suppressors. So it makes it very easy to pull apart and clean. Uh, but this guy, being a user serviceable suppressor, stand by. <laughs> a little better. Yeah. Being a uh, user serviceable suppressor, it's rated for your rim fires all the way up to 300 wind mag. And uh, you oh, wow. can run it in a few different configurations. So you can put the flush mount direct thread adapter that's available on there, or you can run it with the blast chamber. So it has a couple of extended blast chambers. This is actually two pieces right here. Mm -hmm. So you can run uh, an extended blast chamber for some of your... Um, you know, higher powered rifle cartridges. I think they mentioned uh, like 350 Legend, 300 Blackout, stuff like that. And then you can run the full size 
blast chamber for your 308s, magnum cartridges, things like that. And if you just want a little bit of extra suppression, more volume equals better suppression and uh, less SPLs, uh, sound pressure levels at your ear and at the muzzle. So hmm. Aspect 30 by um, Armor Specialties out of Pennsylvania. And they're a very small uh, manufacturer. So we've played around with some of their stuff in the past. I believe I did a review on their Aspect 22 a while back. It was actually a, a very nice can. And for the money, it's kind of hard to beat. And they're very durable. Uh, this one is not full auto rated. This is actually the titanium version. So this entire assembly, as you see it here, is 14 ounces. So wow. it kind of disappears on the end of a uh, full size rifle, which is really nice these days. A lot of folks are going for the lightweight options more than anything else. So, huh. That's really cool. Yeah, there's so many suppressor companies coming out of the woodworks, and they're doing a great job. They are. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, well, in the mail, I got these Gators glasses, new lens. They're called the Havoc, and they're pretty big. Uh, at first, I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, it has, like, the same aluminum frames that you're used to. Just see if I could try it. I don't think any I shrapnel don't. is going to get past those. No, I know. <laughs> now, those I are range. Was thinking, yeah. They're they range are, glasses, right? Yeah. Okay. But I was like thinking I, I was supposed to go skiing next week, and I was like, hmm, I could probably wear these. Um, just because, you know, same thing applies. You don't really want any snow in your face. But what's nice about these is um, just like their blast shields, so you lift this up, the little nose piece, and then you can take this out and kind of bear with me because I haven't literally I just opened the box and so I haven't really messed with these. Um, but you take that out and then it comes with a, a nice case where you can put multiple lenses. So then if you want to, to put the clear lenses, you would just stick it in like this. I think you got to put that in. There we go. You got to put in that in first. And then put this down. There we go. Very cool. Yeah. I don't know. I I mean, yeah. I I don't know if I could pull them off as well. Um, they're definitely they're definitely big. But I don't know. It's just kind of nice to see them expand to like so many different lenses or so many different frames, and. Um, and so there's like so many different options. And then, yeah, like I said, this, this little case is really like convenient because you can fold it all up. And if you're, whether you're shooting indoors, outdoors, experiencing some snow, you know, or whatever, uh, you could just change out the lenses really quickly. But if you guys want to check it out, Gator. So, um, they gave me a URL for you to get 15% off. It's gators.com forward slash Ava. That's A-V-A-1-5. So definitely check them out. Snow? What's that? Snow. I know. It's it's everywhere all over my house right now. And my stupid butt decided to buy a house where it faces north. So when it snows, I look at that snow for like three months when my neighbors across the street have zero snow. It is like literally such a night and day difference. So if anybody is thinking about buying a house and they don't know, I should have went with my mom's uh, advice, but always buy a house that is facing south or i mean actually my last house is facing west so it really wasn't bad but you don't want it to be facing north it's horrible well we get a few uh dustings and uh georgia shuts down so yeah i'm sure we got like two feet of snow the other day and i con was trying to convince my friend that we should still go up to denver because it wasn't it was like 37 degrees and so i was like well it hasn't like frozen <laughs> over i'm like it's just driving through snow and we should still go and i'm kind of glad we didn't we went the next day but all right. Uh, so now is uh, would you rather? So would you rather twenty two WMR or seventeen HMR? And I will be honest with you, I have very little experience with either seventeen HMR. I've used a few times for like planking and stuff. I know it's it's kind of common for like hunting small game, mm -hmm. uh, which I'd imagine twenty two WMR is too. But I don't really have any experience with. And not so, enough to like, make an educated decision. And then I'm also like, okay, but for what? What are we using this for? Yeah, so that 
the the end use is uh, one of the big questions because 22 Winchester Magnum Rimfire has been around for quite some time, and especially just like an Extendo uh, 22 LR. So it's got more more powder, more power, more velocity, and uh, you're getting some good energy downrange. So it's great for small games, a lot flatter shooting than 22 long rifle. Uh, the only disadvantage, if you want to be super duper quiet, you know, you're not going to get subsonic 22 MR or WMR. It's all supersonic stuff. Uh, usually up around like the 2,000 feet per second mark on some of the wider loads. Um, 17 HMR, that's Hornady Magnum Rimfire. That came out in the early 2000s, and it's basically just a 22 um, WMR, neck down to accept a 17 cal projectile, a .177 projectile, um, I believe. And you're getting some silly velocities with it. It's super flat shooting, uh, way less drop and wind drift than a 22. And it's great for small critters. So if you're talking like gophers, ground squirrels, you know, the like, uh, small rabbits, squirrels, uh, tree, you know, tree rats, as we like to call them here in Georgia, anything small like that, it's 17 is just devastating on them. And uh, it's actually used in a lot of um, rimfire matches, you know, as well. But um, previously, it was really only available in like bolt actions. And there are very few semi autos uh, a while back that actually would handle the round because. Uh, most of the 22s are just blowbacks, and it had such a high chamber pressure um, that it would break components and wasn't exactly safe to shoot. Uh, Savage recently, uh, within the past few years, released a 17-specific uh, um, semi-auto rifle, magazine-fed semi-auto, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, you get you know pretty high uh, rate of fire capabilities with that, so you can really like lay down the the log with critters out there, but. Um, CZ has a number of firearms that are switch barrels. So that would be my my thing is like, why not have both instead of just one? Uh, you can get yeah. like a 455 or a 457, uh, the some newer models, the bolt actions. And um, just with a couple of set screws, you can pop the old barrel off and you can put a fresh barrel on. And as long as you zero each one and you remember your torque settings, you know, mm -hmm. for your action screws and your, your barrel attachments um, set screws, you'll be within half MOA of your previous, you know, settings. When you're swapping those barrels, you just keep good notes and you're good to go. So, Wow. That's good to know. Because you said, you mentioned in the last show that you're a huge fan of CZ, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, my sister is too. She always, she's always shooting at CZ guns. Very cool. All right, well, there you have it. Why choose when you can have both the best or best of both worlds? All right, so listener questions. This one came from Rat Ride Number One. Chad seems like a good fit. Hope the show is a success for both of you. It's always good to get someone else's perspective on the subject. Are you going to make him eat hot peppers too? Mention my crazy pepper jellies. <laughs> well, pepper jellies. I don't know. That sounds uh, interesting. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you watched the episode where Eric ate the hot peppers. I watched and, a little bit of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody sent him. So I didn't do it because I was like, I don't even know this guy. I don't want to give him my address. I don't have a P.O. box number. And then I'm just going to eat, you know, food from a stranger. Like, my mom taught me better than that. But I'm like, Eric, on the other hand, <laughs> he could do it. Um, but, yeah, um, I don't, I'm not going to make you do that, Chad. Well, so my, my tolerance for heat uh, has dissipated in the last few years. I used to eat really spicy stuff all the time, but oh, it tears me up so bad now. Um, really? Yeah, it's awful. But the pepper jelly, so you ever had like jalapeno pepper jelly before? Yeah. You know, yeah, you did on a wrist cracker with cream cheese. All right. Yep. Well, I decided a couple of years ago to experiment a little bit. So I made ghost pepper jelly. And uh -huh. I also made Carolina Reaper pepper jelly. And it's funny, I gave my father-in-law some, and um, every time he opens it, he's like, he sends me text messages. And it's like, oh, this pepper jelly is hot. Every time, <laughs> it's like the same thing. Every time, I'm like, oh, you broke it open again. Do you have some some visitors? You you subject them to it? And you're like, yeah, they liked it, but they said, oh, it's hot. But yeah, <laughs> I had to wear a mask when I was cooking because, you know, when you're cooking uh -huh. jellies, you're you're heating everything up you know adding sugar and all and i mean i've got all this carolina reaper steam coming in my face yeah. <laughs> oh so. man well i mean i get like that sometimes even with certain jalapenos and then let's say i cut it up on a cutting board and then i go to wash my cutting board in the sink and like with the mm -hmm. hot water and the steam and i have to like run my garbage disposal put some dawn dish soap in it yep. because otherwise 
it'll be like days later and like I'll get like suddenly some fumes coming out from under, you know, from the sink and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm like, that's just jalapenos. So, I mean, but some of those jalapenos can be pretty spicy and then others, it's like, this does not taste like a jalapeno. Yeah, I've done a lot of, uh, well, speaking of the, the topic, I've done a lot of canning, you know, with jalapeno peppers and other peppers. Yeah. And I've had my contacts in before and I never make that mistake again because it gets stuck in my contacts and yeah. it doesn't wash out overnight. I'll put my contacts in the next day and my eyes are oh. just and burning. So, Dang. Sure. yeah. Yeah. So don't worry. I'm not going to, I'm not, you're not going to eat the peppers. Thank you. Now, before we go into listener comments, I want to talk about electronic transfer. So electronic transfer is a merchant service. It's great to have if you are running a business and you don't want to be shut down unexpectedly or, you know, any of your um, merchant services, I guess, canceled unexpectedly while you're trying to operate a business because I've known, you know, so many banks that have done this and uh, I hate to say it, but like they're really cracking down nowadays where it's like there's very few companies that will even you know, take you up as a customer, but it's like, okay, well, if you're a firearms instructor, we can kind of work with that. But if you sell guns, no, forget it. It's like they treat you like you're a criminal. Whereas uh, electronic transfer, they are here specifically for people in the firearms industry. Um, Everybody is welcome. You don't have to have a firearms related company in order to use their merchant services, but they were made specifically in order to help out the people that are getting cut off left and right and being treated like criminals. So check them out. Electronic transfer. We do have a sign up sheet or I'm sorry, a sign up link and it is electronic transfer.com forward slash sign dash up dash now. Again, electronic transfer.com forward slash sign dash up dash now. Click on it or however you sign up, just let them know that we sent you. We greatly appreciate it. Okay, listener comments. So this comment came from Camp David 54. He said, 40 states still recognize the Second Amendment. Let's see how many do this time next year. Thoughts? Um, so I wonder why he means by 40 states already recognized. Because, I mean, if you think about it, like constitutional carry. I mean, isn't that, that's like 27 states now that are, that's constitutional carry? I, I believe it's up to 27, yeah. It may be more. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely more than half. I know that. Um, but I wonder, you know, what that, the 50 states, like, does that mean that you can, because I mean, I'll be honest, like Colorado used to be very red and now it's, it's unfortunately it's blue. I mean, we've had so many gun laws passed where you, you know, you have to be now 21 to buy a rifle. Whereas previously at 18, you could buy a rifle and you had to wait till you're 21 to buy a pistol. Now you have to wait three days before, you know, you fill out the background check and three days before you can actually leave with that firearm. Mm. So there's like so many different laws that have passed. And it's like, so what would you even, I mean, nowadays it's hard to even say like what state actually recognizes our second amendment, because in my opinion, all of that goes against the second amendment. It does. I mean, for a state not to rec- rec- uh, recognize one part of the constitution, they might as well not recognize any of it in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But um, there are several states that are very draconian as far as gun laws uh, go and uh, the 2A is concerned, but with recent court uh, victories, you know, from cases brought forth by like GOA and FPC, um, I think the ties are definitely turning as far as what states are capable of um, in the letter of the law regarding the Second Amendment and the way that they restrict people's uh, God-given rights. So I think in the next few years, especially, we're going to see a lot of these cases come to fruition and some precedent being set where um, some of these laws won't even get brought up on the you know Senate and House floors in these states, uh, even for consideration in the future because of the precedent that's going to be set now. So, mm-hmm. yeah, well, I definitely think also the Bruin decision helped uh, significantly too. And I mean, if if you look at just recently with California how California right now, uh, people were able to purchase ammo and have it shipped to their door, which is what the rest of us are able to do. But California has to go through that background check. They did just put a stay, the Ninth Circuit just put a stay on that. Um, But that is not, you know, the outcome of the case. It's still, you know, so hopefully it'll work in their favor. But yeah, I don't know. Either way, I think it's really important. I say this all the time in Gun Funny, but super important not to be complacent and to definitely voice your opinion. Write to your representatives. Let them know how you feel. 
Um, it's not that hard to find out, you know, who do you contact? Just, you know, just Google who are my representatives for Colorado Springs, Colorado or wherever you're in. And, uh, and it'll list that. I'll say uh, real quick, just to add to that, um, if you're a member of GOA or FBC, they have awesome tools right there on their websites. They yes. give you all the information for your local representatives down to a county level in a lot of cases. So you can find out exactly who your reps are. You have their contact info, their mailing addresses, emails, so you can voice your opinions direct. And uh, GOA especially also put together um, um, basically like political leaflets almost. Um, so if there's a, a bill that's coming down the pipeline, they'll draft a letter and all you have to do is add your name to it to show your support or your disdain for that given piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a really good point. Next is from Muzzleblast88. Heard his voice and thought, thank God ain't seen him in forever. <laughs> is Chad alive? <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, that's like a really sweet comment. So I put that one in there because, yeah, I think a lot of people are like, what happened to Chad? And, yeah, so. Just been working behind the scenes a lot, you know, trying to get the shop up and running. So, yeah. Well, I'm happy to have you here. I was actually just thinking, I'm like, who would have thought that we'd be working together? I think the last time that I saw you in person, we were hunting alligators. Yeah, there was that. I think the time before we were down at the um, uh, the Big Daddy Unlimited shoot. I think the, you know, I was carpooling. Yeah. yeah, I was carpooling everybody around. That was down at the 17 South um, Rod and Gun Club outside of Savannah there. Yeah. yeah we were I, having a good old time. I think I was like, you look like a Cabbage Patch doll. And I was being all like hyper and crazy in the car. I don't know. I think maybe Eric was driving. And maybe Brandon Herrera was in the back seat with us. I don't know. I, I don't think so. Really it, it was an interesting posse, that's for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. And they're probably like, "Let's get this crazy girl out of our car." But yeah, it's yeah. always fun seeing. It's always fun seeing y'all at the events. Y'all always like catching up with our industry friends. So I'm yeah. glad to be here too. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now the main topic. So we figured since we talked about you know bug out bags last episode, um, we want to highlight more about like prepping. And I just think because 2024 is going to be a little, like, I think it's going to be crazy. I think that uh, there's probably going to be a lot of unknown stuff that happens. And I'll be honest, I'm not like the biggest prepper in the world. I'm not, you know, as you'd say, well, I would say I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I've definitely become a little bit more of that over the years. Um, but I mean, I live alone. I, if you look at my refrigerator, I have like some string cheese and pickles and then alcohol in my refrigerator, <laughs> but I think I need to step up my game. And I figured if I need to step up my game, chances are a lot of you guys do too. Um, Chad is like, I mean, he just showed us some pictures, my editor and I, he was showing us some pictures before we uh, got on to record this segment. And like you have the perfect setup. It's so impressive. And so I figured, you know, who better to talk to you about this than you. But before we start going into that, let's just kind of go down and like sort of give, I guess, like the history of food preservation. Well, I don't, I don't know if I've got the perfect setup. I've got a setup that works for our given situation, which I think is what anybody can, uh, you know, strive to do. But so food preservation has been around forever. Okay. I mean, like, as long as humans have been on this earth, there's been some way of, you know, keeping food for a later time. If you're, a, you know, you're in a cold climate, just leave it outside, right? And it just freezes, then you just put it over the fire and cook it. Um, you know, salt was used to cure uh, foods back in the day, just to help preserve and and whatnot. They would dry cure things, um, you know, any number of things. But back oh, in the even, oh, go ahead. I was thinking even so. I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. So when this show comes out, I will have been back. But um, even in, you know, the Mexican culture, how they dig a hole really, because it's super hot there, but they dig a hole like super deep down into the ground where it's cooler and that's where they keep their food. Yeah. So that's kind of like a root cellar, just a makeshift root cellar. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty neat. Just the the food preservation and storage methods that different cultures have come up with based on their climate and such are, are very impressive. And you can learn a lot from, from studying it. Um, focusing on like more modern food preservation methods, uh, like back in the Napoleonic age, you know, when he was going across Europe, you know, the saying was always like an army marches on its stomach. So if you can't feed your army, you can't move forward and conquer, right? So they, um, 
he basically had a, 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 almost like a contest to try to figure out uh, if somebody could come up with a way to store food uh, for travel and be able to, you know, cook it and seal it up and then eat it at a later time and it still be uh, good quality, safe to eat, free of, you know, bacteria and microbes, which were unknown of at the time. Um, but a gentleman came up with a way of canning food. And it was very crude early on, you used cork and wax and things, but they would basically just cook the food, put it in a jar like a vessel, seal it up, and it was good to go. And there's been canned items like that uh, brought up from shipwrecks that are 100 plus years old. And the food product is, it just looks like goo at that point, but it's been tested and deemed safe to consume, free of microbes, free of bacteria. So it just goes to show you the testament to, you know, the quality of those old school preservation methods. Um, the, the general, uh, canning procedure is the same now as it always has been. It's just, we have more modern, um, you know, modern components to be able to, you know, store the food, but it's still a little bit taboo to a lot of folks. You know, you, I, I talk to people all the time about how long I keep stuff canned and they're thinking, huh, what you can't, yeah. eat? what I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but it's been around for a very long time, you know, multiple types of methods. So yeah. Oh, well, I mean, just take, for example, even the other day, uh, I went out with a few of my girlfriends and we were we were all saying we all live alone. And so it's like, yeah, you know, we don't cook that much because if we do cook, it's like, cool, what do I want to eat for like the next five days? And then uh, I was like, yeah, and I I do like leftovers depending what it is. Um, obviously I don't want to cook like a steak and then leftovers aren't as good, but usually in most cases, leftovers are better like a day or two after. But then my friend's like, yeah, but like I can only eat leftovers for so long. So then I get weird about it. And it's so weird how even we've like, even have this, like, Oh, even though it's refrigerated, it's like, e, but how long has it been in there? And, you know, and people who like food prep on, let's say Sunday and, it's supposed to last until Friday, like whatever you made on Sunday. I'm like, I don't know if I'd even want that. So yeah, it, it is it's very it is. much. Yeah. But it still is like, so like, it is very much like taboo. Mm -hmm. And then even the pictures that I saw where you cook all these like stews and stuff and then put it in cans. And then I'm like, are you refrigerating that? Like it looked really good. Mm -hmm. So you, so you cook it and then you're not even, you just put it in a can and then just put it like in some like cool dry place, I'd assume. Yeah, so I mean, I can go ahead and talk about that. Uh, so, like, just for example, I brought some some props. All right, so what are these? Green beans. Yep, green beans. All right, so these are pressure canned. All right, so there's two different types of canning processes: um, water bath, water bath, and pressure canning. Uh, certain foods have to be water bath canned, or they can be water bath canned, and then other foods have to be pressure pressure can because of the low uh, acid content. Um, green beans are one of those. So basically the, the raw green beans, you know, we'll grow these or I'll go to the farmer's market and get, you know, whole green beans. I'll bring them home and I have a tiny army at my house and tiny hands that are good for this purpose. But, um, you know, they'll break the green beans. We'll sort everything out. I'll wash them. And then I uh, just cook them just very gently, just like, you know, parboil them. And then I uh, Put them in the jars, fill the jars up with broth, put a little salt in it, seal it up with a flat, and then put a ring on it, and then it goes in the canner. And then it comes up to a certain pressure and temperature. And under pressure, you know, you can get uh, the temperature well above boiling. Um, you know, some foods require like 230 to 240 degrees to kill off uh, the microbes that cause botulism. Uh, botulism is some, you know, it's the biggest fear of home canned goods. Uh, because there is an associated risk of having botulism show up in your home can items, but you follow some simple steps, you'll be able to avoid that. But anyways, uh, you just pressure can it at that certain uh, temperature and pressure for a given amount of time based on whatever it is that you're canning. And once it's done, you let everything cool down, pull the lid off once your pressure drops, pull the jars out, they cool down uh, for about you know, 12 to 24 hours, and uh, you can store them on the shelf. And most canned vegetables, they retain full quality for at least five years, if not longer than that. Uh, quality can kind of degrade. They'll get a little softer over time. But I've had you know, green beans and stuff on the shelf and collards as long as maybe seven or eight years before I you know, track them down. They may have been hiding in the back. And uh, I'll crack them open and put them on the stovetop with some 
salt pork or whatever, and I'll cook them up, and they're just like the day that I canned them. Um, hmm. So they're very safe to eat and uh, safe to store at room temperature. Uh, as long as it's not too hot, not too cold, you know, relatively temperature controlled environment. Um, I also do a lot of meat. So this is a canned chicken breast. So this is free range chicken I buy from the butcher and I just bring it home, chop it up, put it in a jar raw, put a little bit of water on the bottom, seal it up, put it in a pressure canner for an hour and a half for quarts and it fully cooks the chicken and it makes broth. And I use this in meals for my entire family all year long. And wow. You know, I normally have at least um, at least 12 quarts of any given product at a time. Most of the time I have at least 24 and I rotate things out throughout the year. Um, but you mentioned like this. That's crazy though. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't even have thought of like the chicken breast at first when you held it up. I'm like, oh, I see you're making some sauerkraut. <laughs> no, I've, look, I've made sauerkraut. We'll talk about it for a minute and stuff. Um, but Meats and vegetables are really easy to home can if you just get past that taboo aspect of it. It's a really simple process. Follow the instructions, do it safely, and just keep your eye out for the signs that a jar has maybe failed. I mean, the the lid right here, like I'm just grabbing onto the edge of it for, for the viewers, okay? Like, that's on there. That ain't coming off. It's, it's a vacuum in there. It's a perfectly sealed environment that's free of germs and microbes and nothing's getting out nothing's getting in right <laughs> um this is chicken curry okay so this has like potatoes onions raisins uh and, you know curry tomatoes chicken right you just put everything in here it cooks in the jar and then when i want to make this for the family i'll pour it out into a pan and uh, or a pot and i'll put a little um uh coconut milk in it just to kind of mm -hmm. thicken it up a little bit. And then I just yeah. make some rice and serve it over that. It's a quick and dirty you know, meal. But you can do beef stews, chili, all kinds of soups, uh, chicken noodle soup base. So mm -hmm. not only is it a way to store food for a rainy day, but it's also a way to have quick and healthy meals for your family um, you know, on a regular basis if you just kind of keep things rotated out and you keep a stock you know, of it. a lot of folks will do all this work and they'll just put it on the shelf and never use it. Yeah. I mean, that's all fine and good. You can do that. But, you know, it helps to, you know, kind of hone your skills and keep your skill set alive. Mm -hmm. um, and then you rotate everything out. So you're getting the maximum shelf life out of everything. And you're also saving money in the long run, too, by doing all the stuff yourself at home. And you know what went into it. That's a big yeah. thing with me is I know what's going into the food that I feed myself and my kids. Yeah. Um, and well, and my wife, you know, yeah. But, um, and you're eating so much healthier too. And yeah. it's going to be a lot better than like these freeze dried meals or the MREs that, yeah. you know, are going to be as good. Um, now like this is home canned stuff. Now commercial canned items are perfectly viable. So if, if you just want to stock up, if you don't have the space or the, um, wherewithal to do like home canning or you don't have a farmer's market close by, which is yeah, yeah. kind of hard to believe. Or, or even the time, I guess, yeah. to put all this in it, to can. It takes some time. And I've had to, you know, I've had to put a lot of other things to the side to make sure that I can do this, you know, for my family. Um, I, I make, I literally make the time. I give up certain things and I make the time to take care of this no matter how long it takes. Um, but commercial items are perfectly viable and do not believe the expiration date on a can of green beans or corn at the store. If it says, you know, you're well, going to throw it out, got to throw it out in 2024 by this day. Otherwise you're going to die. No, no, that food will stay good in that can for years and years to come. The quality will degrade, but you could crack open a can of green beans 10 years down the line and it's still perfectly safe to eat. And it's probably still pretty good. I mean, they don't turn to mush until you get to maybe the, 15 year mark give or take right. that um you know as long as the can the, the actual like tin can itself isn't rusted or perforated in some way and it's still sealed 100 percent, you're good you're good to go and it's fine mm -hmm. spam spam might as well last forever uh canned tuna canned meats you know canned chicken it's the same thing as what i showed you in this jar here uh it's just commercially done and loaded with sodium and it's probably from chickens that aren't free range that ate a bunch of random feed and, you know, seed oil based crap and nonsense, but commercial canned stuff is perfectly fine. Um, you can just stock up on a lot of, um, 
vegetables and a lot of meats and rotate it out. And if you're a single individual, you, know, you can get a lot of food that can last you a long time just from the grocery store, especially if you get it on sale, you can save a lot of money on it, but use it and then replenish it over time. Um, so like another type of food that's really good for prepping, practical prepping is dehydrated foods. Um, so you can find a lot of, um, like meals in a bag that are kind of ready to go at the grocery store. Right. And they'll consist of a lot of dried vegetables, seasonings. Um, they may have some rice or beans in them. You just put it in a pot, add some water, cook it, and then you got a meal. Right. So all the individual components that go into that, you can do that at home too. All right. So these are dried carrots. <laughs> I thought you were going to say bacon. Well, no, no, no. So you see how like tiny they are. These are dehydrated. Yeah. Dehydrated carrots. Huh, so, and you say you have a dehydrator? I do. Yeah. So I've got, a, um, it's like a, like an eight or nine shelf dehydrator. I've used it quite a bit. I, I do fruits and vegetables in it. Um, but and I've done so like what do you do with those carrots. Uh, so like... yeah, so I use the carrots um, and like onion and celery to make soup bases with. Mm -hmm. So I'll mix that with some rice um, and various seasonings, and I'll make my own uh, meal bases at home and have them in jars ready to go. And I'll only keep maybe like six or eight, uh, like yeah. pint and a half jars at any given time of of a few different things that my family likes. Um, especially if I travel, it's easy for my wife to grab one of those jars, throw it on the stovetop, add some chicken or whatever, and be done with it. Um, but yeah, that, I make my own like soup mixes and stuff. So, so. I also recently saw in a Facebook group, uh, somebody, it, it was like some gardening group and there was this lady who, um, essentially would dehydrate all of these vegetables and then, uh, make it into a powder and then mix it with like, let's say marinara sauce or something, because it was a way for her kids to get more vegetables mm -hmm. without them realizing that they were eating the vegetables. Yep. That's exactly I like, right. Huh, I need that in my life. Yep. Um, another thing uh, that's really good for storage is your, like your freeze dried foods. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they'll think dehydrated and freeze-dried is the same thing. Uh, yeah. They're similar, but they're they're very different processes and what the end result is. So with dehydrated foods, you get down to about 10 to 15% moisture content, and that gives you about a 10 to 15-year shelf life on most mm -hmm. dehydrated foods. Uh, freeze-drying uh, is a process where the food product is actually frozen. It's refrigerated down to you know, zero or below, and it's pulling uh, a vacuum in the space as well. So it's pulling all the moisture out down to like one to 2% moisture remaining. So that gives mm -hmm. you a 25 to 30 year shelf life on this food. So wow. there's a lot of companies out there that do these prepackaged like buckets, right? You've seen like My Patriot yeah. Supply and others, um, yeah. but you can buy like a 30 day food supply for a family of four in a bucket. Right. And all you do is add water. Yeah. And that's a great way to store a lot of food that's, you know, reasonably healthy and it'll get you through a really tough time. I mean, like 2020 was crazy. And yeah, that's when I got back into all this because I said, nope, I pulled out mm -hmm. some seeds. I started my garden back up. That's when I really got back into it. Um, but yeah, freeze dried food is an excellent option. It's a little bit more expensive in some cases. Um, but if you buy it kind of piecemeal and you mm -hmm. just like allocate a little bit of budget each month um, or maybe bi-weekly and, and get just something by the time like a year rolls around, you'll have a huge supply of food and you'll be well ahead of probably 75 to 85% of people out there as far as preparedness goes. Um, but so like with the home canning stuff too, uh, let's see where we're at. MREs. Yeah. So look, you mentioned MREs earlier. Yeah. These are great. I, I used to eat those for fun as a kid because my dad had a bunch and my sister and I would like take an MRE and we'd like share it. And we used to think like the little tiny Tabasco thing was so cute. And, you know, I, I just, maybe they were okay when I was a kid ish. Like there was, yeah. de there was definitely some that were better than others, but. Well, I mean, um, that's still the case. They're loaded with sodium. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, but definitely. but they're they're good in a pinch and they'll last for 
quite a long time. And, um, you know, you can buy them surplus stores and stuff for a dime a dozen, but they'll have some years on the expiration date already. You know, unlike yeah. buying brand new ones from, well, I think these came from MRE Nation a while back. Yeah. But, um, it's good to have a variety of uh, food preps. You know, have some MREs uh, for quick and dirty, have some freeze dried, have some dehydrated, have some home canned and commercial stuff and rotate everything out. I can't reiterate that enough. Rotate things out. Yeah. Uh, so I was doing some homework because I figured, all right, I got to do, you know, I got to add to uh, the podcast as well. So I, I found some foods that actually do not have a shelf life whatsoever. So honey, for example, due to its low moisture content and acidity pH or an acidic pH, Honey has an indefinite shelf life. It may crystallize over time, but can easily be liquefied by gentle heating it up uh, or gently heating it up. Salt, as long as it's stored in a dry environment, it does not expire. And I guess salt would also be used, you know, well in order to uh, to keep meat and stuff like that from, which is so crazy. Like, it's crazy to think that somebody at one point came up with that. Like they found salt and they made salt and then they were like, hey, if we put this on our meat, it'll actually last a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, that reminds me of uh, one food preservation method that you, I don't know if you're even aware of. Uh, did you watch Game of Thrones? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember them mentioning the larders? No. When In like some of the scenes where they were preparing big meals for huge groups, they would mention like get the pork out of the larder. Well, you could store raw meat, right? Or even like partially cooked meat, I think in some cases, in a big box and just fill it with lard, like literally just fat, like cooked huh. fat, right? And the lard adds a layer of protection that keeps the meat fresh. So that was a larder. They would store it in uh, like a rendered fat is what lard is basically. Interesting. So. Huh. Uh, also, something that doesn't have a um, expiration date is rice, uh, dried beans, uh, as long as they're, you know, I mean, black beans, kidney beans, lentils, uh, pure maple syrup, if properly sealed and stored in the refrigerator. But, I mean, we're assuming that we might have electric, but we probably won't. Um, it says, however, it may develop mold or spoil if exposed to air or stored at room temperature. And then vinegar. So mm. both white vinegar and apple cider vinegar have an almost indefinite shelf life when stored in a cool and dark place. Yeah. So those were on my list of things to keep as far as food preps, you know, salts, other condiments, uh, or, you know, seasonings, things like that. But vinegar, especially because that's how you pickle things, right? Pickling mm -hmm. is a huge thing. So you can take just about anything. I mean, eggs, meats, vegetables, whatever, and you can pickle it. And it's a great preservation method. And uh, a lot of old timers, when they were making pickles, all they would do is just put like cucumbers are the most common, right? They would take cucumbers, garlic, dill, uh, whatever else, some pickling seasoning, and they would just put it in a jar. And they would take their vinegar, they would heat it up on the stovetop, pour it in to the jar, put the lid on it, put it on the shelf, and that was it. That was how they pickled stuff. They didn't mm -hmm. do any of this, uh, like, water bath for five or ten minutes and, and whatnot. They would just put it on a shelf, and they were done. And, like, my grandparents did it. Their grandparents did it. I mean, it's an age-old thing, and everybody survived, right? Um, but pickling is great. Vinegar is a great uh, method of preserving food, um, and it's essential to have on hand. Um, so, and it tastes good, too. I'm, I like so actually, also the key ingredient to hard-boiled eggs or to I'm sorry, deviled eggs, is add a little bit of vinegar. Mm, so good. Yep. So yeah. um, as far as uh, fermented foods, so um, you mentioned sauerkraut earlier. So I mm -hmm. make sauerkraut on a regular basis. Um, which, which apparently is really good for your gut health. It is so naturally fermented foods that you do at home. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like kombucha. Right. Uh, anything. Uh, uh, kimchi. All right. I've made kimchi in the past. Um, and then sauerkraut, especially. Uh, it has natural probiotics present that are excellent for your gut and your digestive system. And, you know, a lot of um, like 
people that kind of circle the holistic realm, right? They believe that everything comes from, you know, your gut, like everything involving your health comes from your stomach mm-hmm. and the way your digestive system is operating and like the good bacteria that's present, it affects every other part of your body. Um, and I, I mean, I believe that to a certain degree for sure. Um, but the, the sauerkraut, for example, you buy in the store, all right, it's in a jar, it's been mm-hmm. canned. So it's been cooked and all the probiotics have been killed. So it has no probiotic benefit whatsoever. Um, even like the, the bag stuff, sometimes it doesn't have the probiotics in it that you really are expecting, the, the kind that's just refrigerated. It has more than the canned stuff, but it doesn't have anything like what you have at home. Um, mm-hmm. But fermenting is so easy. It's like with, with cabbage, you just slice it up, put it in a jar, put some water, salt in it, and you just let it go. And it'll naturally ferment. It'll bubble up and all. And then I usually let mine go for 30 days. And then um, after that, I store it in the fridge. But, you know, I, I do mine in jars with these vent lids. But the old school method is just to use a big crock, put all your cabbage in there, and you just keep the actual cabbage weighted down below the top level of the liquid. And um, that keeps all the bacteria and microbes from invading and growing on there, like mold and whatnot. And it um, it ferments just at room temperature, right? Wow. Who would have, um, I would have thought that that would have been, I mean, just even keeping it open and having it like anything could just like get inside. How does that keep out the bacteria? The, just like the it, water, you know? the water level. So it just, everything's below the surface of the water. And like, if there's any yeah. scum that develops on the top, you literally just scrape it off. Wow. I mean, the good bacteria outweighs the bad bacteria and, you know, yeah. they always win. Um, but fermenting is great. And it's a like kombucha and kimchi, especially, um, you know, I usually keep a couple of jars of kimchi at any given time. And we make ramen, um, like homemade ramen and stuff quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And I'll throw some kimchi on there just to get some extra probiotics. And I would have sauerkraut for breakfast sometimes with like eggs and avocado. I'd just throw a spoon of sauerkraut on there just to, you know, get my gut working. Yeah. Um, You know, um, um, I will say kimchi, though, is it smells so bad. Like in a lot of Asian cultures, they actually have a kimchi fridge. mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, just like literally a, a refrigerator designated to their kimchi. And I've bought kimchi before, and it's like, even though it's sealed and it's in the refrigerator, I open that refrigerator and I'm like, oh, it stinks. Like, I just can't keep it in my house for long. I love it. It tastes really good, but no, it's it's like the smell just gets me every time. Yeah. Um, also, some, some good items to keep on hand when you're doing food preps are your pastas and grains. You mentioned rice and beans earlier. Um, you know, Pastas are great. Uh, dried pastas, they're shelf stable. They last just about forever, right? Um, but I also keep a lot of um, flour on hand, just commercial bag flour. I usually buy the King Arthur brand. And um, what I typically do is I put it in the freezer like overnight, and that makes sure it kills off any little like boll weevils or, you know, little bugs that might be in there because they're always going to be present. Um, get rid of those. Always, I'll bring. Are always going to be in the flour. Bugs are uh, always going to be in the flour. Yeah, yeah. You really? Know that? Yeah. No. Yeah. Always. Yeah. How I don't understand. How does how do bugs develop in the flour? Even if you they don't they don't they, don't they don't develop in the flour. They're just there. They they go through the milling process and everything. And like the little eggs can still yeah. be in there. It's gross. But look, look I mean, yeah. it's, it's there. It's, it's there, but like Next you cook time it. I, time I eat a cookie, I'm going to be like, well, oh, okay, do I know? Oh, I might be like some little bug eggs in here. Man, if folks only knew what happens at these big, like, flour and sugar plants and all. But anyway, yeah. so put it in the freezer, kill off all the knickknacks, right? And um, I bring it out room temperature, I vacuum seal it. Um, I'll talk about equipment later, but I vacuum seal my flour, and I, I keep 25 pounds of a few varieties on hand at any given time. Self-rising wheat or self-rising bread and all-purpose, and then I keep wheat berries on hand, and I've got a flour mill and everything. And uh, depending on the situation, I'll break open one of my vacuum sealed bags, and if I go down to like 15 pounds on the shelf, I'll go and buy 10 more pounds, vacuum seal it, move it to the back of the rack. But I always keep 75 pounds of flour plus wheat berries, at least 50 pounds of wheat berries on hand at any given time, 
Um, and that what gives are, you a lot so, of stupid, stupid question, but like, what are wheat berries? So wheat berries are the seeds, you know, the wheat seeds are that they? are, uh, milled into flour. So there's different varieties of wheat berries, um, that each one has like varying levels of gluten content and they're better for certain types of breads or pastries and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the wheat berry is just the wheat seed. It's just what's threshed off of the um, stalk. And uh, like I said, the wheat berries are what you get in a big bag and you mill it down into flour. And that's what you make breads and stuff with. Um, but I make homemade breads quite often, cookies, cakes. Um, I've done uh, some pastries. Like I've made some puff pastry before. I don't ever want to do that again. It's such a pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> but I make, I make a lot of homemade pastas. And yeah. it's really quick and dirty. And just knowing how to do that stuff, kind of getting back to your old roots, in my opinion, is part of being well prepared from a food standpoint is having the knowledge to make a lot of this stuff from scratch, which has been kind of a lost art over the last um, several decades, you know, since this sort of like industrial revolution of food and how we eat here in the United States. Uh, that, that's a whole other episode in itself. I mean, comparing the way we eat here, like against oh, other yeah. countries out there, um, yeah. and uh, sugar. What's even, like what's legal here that is being outlawed in other countries too. Yeah, um, sugar is good to keep on hand. Uh, any given time, I've got at least thirty-five to fifty pounds of sugar at home, all sealed yeah. up. As long as it's yeah. vacuum sealed, you're good to go. Well, especially because um, you want to, you know, take care of the women in your family. We all know we like sugar. Well, sugar is a good preservative too. Uh, so like with the jams and jellies, um, most of those are cooked and then they're water bathed or you could just pour them in a jar, put a lid on in a lot of technical sense. It's what a lot of old timers did, like I mentioned before. And um, the sugar acts as a, as a good preservative. Um, but, you know, we like sugar. I mean, come on. Yeah. What about um, butters and stuff? Like do you do any sort of nut butters, like peanut butter, almond butter? Peanut Anything. butter, yeah, you know, I keep a lot of peanut butter on hand because it has a long shelf life, and yeah, my kids love it, and it's packed full of protein, carbs, and mm -hmm. um, you know, calories. So it's it's an excellent energy source too. Um, I just buy like the big old Peter Pans. I mean, mm -hmm. I like Peter Pans. Some people are Jif people, but mm -hmm. I keep several of those on hand. Um, they're great. Crunchy, and I'm, crunchy or smooth? No, smooth. Smooth, okay. yeah. Well, I like crunchy, but yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, what that's about good. what about milk any sort of like dry milk or milk that would you know have a shelf life like a pretty good shelf life to it yeah so that kind of goes back to um that kind of goes back to the dehydrated foods you can buy a lot of dehydrated powdered uh dairy products so mm -hmm. you can buy cheeses milks you can buy whole milk you can buy buttermilk uh you can get powdered eggs those are excellent to have on hand um, and all those have very long shelf lives on them. And once you open them, you know, you could actually make individual meals Well, there's plenty of cookbooks and things out there that kind of help you organize individual meal packets with a lot of, uh, dried, freeze dried and like powdered food products just for emergency situations or camping or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that goes back to the dehydrated foods. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. I think before we continue anymore, we should take a quick break, talk about Rossi. And Rossi, you were looking into the history of this, Chad. It's been around for quite a while. It, uh, I believe, is, where did it originate? It was like Brazil or something? Yeah, so Rossi originated in Brazil in 1889. They're one of the oldest firearms manufacturers out there. And a lot of people, uh, they, they sort of associate Rossi with you know, old school revolvers, lever actions, but Rossi has really gotten into the modern game a lot lately. Uh, mm -hmm. They base a lot of their lever guns off of the, uh, you know, classic Winchester 1892 design. They have some more modern offerings with newer chamberings, threaded barrels, polymer stocks, and in addition to all your classic uh, blued and wood furniture models. And these are just classically styled and well-made guns. And they also have a, um, a new line of revolvers like stainless steel uh, modern revolvers out now as well. Uh, in addition to their old school single shots, rim fires, and some new shotguns that meet just about any budget. Uh, you were discussing one of their newer shotguns in the recent episode. And mm -hmm. I mean, coming in under the $300 price point, 
retail is a great buy for someone looking for a home defense option. But Rossi's really got uh, an extensive catalog that pretty much covers all the bases these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So guys, go ahead and check them out. RossiUSA.com. All right, let's see. I'm trying to think of what else have we not covered. Um, well, when so, you're talking about food stuff, you got to have things to put on your food, right? So you want to stock some condiments. I mean, butter. You know, no, I'm kidding. Butter. All right. So yeah, you were you were asking about butter. Okay. So, oh my gosh, have, have you ever made your own butter? Yeah. My friend does it. It's so easy. I'm like, why have I been buying store bought butter this whole time, and it tastes so much better. And it's like, especially if you have one of those kitchen aids that's just sitting uh -huh. there and it's spinning it for you. I'm like, okay. So I, <laughs> so I want to make mine. I put it in the kitchen oh, aid. And it works so great. Good. So one of the byproducts of butter is, or making butter is buttermilk. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah, so she so, uses, yeah. she uses both. I have a friend that like cooks all the time. We're yeah. total opposite. She cooks. I don't, you know, yeah. whatever. So like I mentioned, powdered butter, I mean, it's a good substitute and uh, it can kind of get you there, but if you've got access to fresh cream, uh, which that kind of gets into like having your own livestock and whatnot, which is another topic for another day, um, you can you can make a lot with fresh cream. I mean, you got your butters, you got your cheeses. I mean, yeah. yogurts, sour cream. The sky is the absolute limit. And again, it gets back into that old school way of doing things, like how our great grandparents would have grown up, you know, living on and off the farm. Right. Uh, that's how they survived back in those days. I mean, like you've had to grow your own food. You had to raise your own livestock. You had to do everything yourself because there weren't commercially viable options out there. And I think a lot of people are kind of, uh, getting back to that old school sentiment these days with the way the world is working. Um, so well, yeah, I definitely think 2020 shook a lot of people up and they realized how unprepared they are. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and is that that's also when you started um, gardening and stuff? I started back. I, I had done it prior to that um, in the early 2010s a good bit, and I kind of got out of it when Eric and I got real busy with the channel and all. And um, I got married. We started having kids and life. So, but 2020 was the catalyst that kind of got me back in that in that game. Um, but with with food preps and all, um, you have to have a way to get water. Uh, a lot of the food products that I mentioned, they rely on having water to be able to prepare them. And you also have to have water to survive. Um, you know, where I currently live, I don't have access to a well. Um, you know, a well on your property is the best way of getting water independently, unless you have a water source like a river or a creek uh, close by. But uh, depending on your space, you know, you're kind of limited on how much water you can actually store. Um, there are several companies that make these, uh, stackable water containers and they're, you know, three and a half to five gallons a piece. And they take up like a closet space, but you can keep, especially as a single person, you can keep enough water to get you through at least a month, you mm -hmm. know, or longer, depending on how much storage capability you have. And you just use like the water purification tablets, uh, or the drops, just there's a certain amount, uh, of the purification, um, product that you use per gallon of water you just do the math on it drop it in there shake it around a little bit and the water is good for you know a year or five years whatever you know the product you're putting into it uh allocates um but you got to have some sort of water on hand we buy uh gallon jugs uh, those like crystal springs or crystal river mm -hmm. and uh, i rotate a lot of those out i usually keep 20 or so of those and i've got some long-term water storage uh, just so we can, you know, drink, cook, bathe, you know, lightly. Um, but water is very, very, very important. Um, and you can also collect, you know, water via um, rainwater collection as well. Um, a lot of, uh, it's considered like non-potable, really. Use it for like your gardening and, uh, you know, watering your plants and watering your animals and things. Um, but you can purify rainwater, you know, too. You can filter it out and you can boil it and you can drink it eventually but you just want to make sure it's safe but um you know what's crazy in some states i know colorado for the longest time it was actually illegal to collect yeah. rainwater like, yeah you you got to be careful with it because some places some municipalities even uh restrict rainwater collect rainwater collection i can yeah. imagine it's a huge thing in california where there's constant droughts and water shortages yeah, yeah um, true. 
Well, real quick, I just want to talk about some of the processing equipment that I use. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do requires some equipment. Um, and like Presto canners are pretty readily available. You can buy them at Walmart or on Amazon. And a lot of times they're between like 50 and maybe $80. Uh, they're kind of the old school way of doing uh, at-home canning. And you can use them as a water bath and a pressure canner. They work pretty well for the money and they get the job done but you're limited on what you can do at a time. Like you can only put seven quarts in those. Um, there's some higher end brands like all American. I have a couple of those and I have a large one. It's a 30 quart model. I could do 14 quarts of a given product in there at a time or 19 pints. And, um, one thing I forgot to mention is I make a lot of broths at home too. That's another thing that you can freeze dry and you can freeze dry just about anything I mentioned on your own. But, um, like if I make chickens, say like I, I grill some chickens or smoke some chickens, we'll eat all the meat and I'll keep all the bones. And the next day, or maybe even that night, depending on my time frame, I'll cook broth. So with the bones, some vegetables, and water, a little bit of salt and pepper, boil it for a while, let it cool down, uh, you know, in an ice bath, put it in the fridge overnight, scrape the fat off the top, strain it all. And then I put it in the jars and I pressure can it. And um, I use that broth to make everything. And that is the healthiest broth that you can you can get. It's like real bone broth. It has all the uh, medicinal and health benefits, you know, that you get out of um, bone, like real bone broth, not store-bought stuff. Um, but you can also cook it down even more and you can get it into like a powder or you can cook it down and, and put it in your freeze dryer and do it in like little chunks. It winds up like almost like peanut brittle. Yeah. But um, I, I could go on and on and on about it. But um, having some canned equipment's good. Um, you know, literature. You know, with instructions and recipes and how to do things safely. Most of the cookbooks out there will give you um, like a one hundred and one on the the full process. Just about anything you want to do. Um, jars, flats, rings. I keep I keep a lot of flats and rings at the house. I mean, at any given time, Ava, I have between 800 and 1,000 jars of food that I've canned at home on rotation. Wow. So, but I've got a family of six. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, that's not feasible for everybody. Um, and, you know, I'm insane. So, I mean, there's that. But um, I, I kind of just wish you were my neighbor because I'm like, <laughs> oh, things, you know, things get a little crazy. I'd be like, all right, well, I'm just going to walk across the street right now to Chad's house. And so you're like, says, you're I'm like, I won't have nothing left if all my neighbors show yeah. up. Everybody um, says that about me with the guns and ammo because I have like tons of guns and ammo at my house. But I'm like, yeah, but I don't know what we're going to eat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Dehydrators, uh, they're kind of a dime or dozen. You can get small ones that fit, you know, your bill and your budget and your space that can do a lot at a time or you can get really big, more commercial type options. Um, they're relatively inexpensive for the most part. Freeze dryers are the most expensive like home food preservation items you can buy. They're typically thousands of dollars. Um, just They just are. They're just expensive pieces of equipment. And that's one thing that I don't have myself yet. Uh, I find myself every time like saving up for uh, a freeze dryer and I wind up spending it on my children's cavities or dental work or something. Yeah. And I'm thinking I'm never going to own a freeze dryer. Um, I've got some friends with them. I use those occasionally, but um, meat processing equipment. We didn't even really get into like hunting and stuff, but that's kind of neither here or there. But um, if you buy meat in bulk, you know, like pork butts or, you know, um, different types of roasts, like chuck roasts and stuff on sale, you can grind all that up at home and make your own ground meats and freeze them or put it in a jar. I mean, I do a lot of ground stuff in jars. I've got a lot of deer meat in jars at the house, and that's like our favorite thing for tacos. Um, but so I can crazy go on. Though. Cause I guess I wouldn't have thought of like putting meat in jars because you just don't see it that often. Like for me, I mean, you ever see like gefilte fish mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that are like, Oh gosh, I, I just, I look at it and it's like in this like gelatin, yeah. like goo and it looks like some white meatball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I know my grandma who was like super Jewish, she would have it at uh at passover and we were just like oh. eh, no we're not trying it but like other than that i haven't really seen 
you know, essentially, like aside from like soups and stuff, I haven't really seen like just like meat in jars. Yeah, so that's I mean, I, I just do, um, I just do deer meat. I cook it a little bit just mm -hmm. so it doesn't clump up so bad. Put it in there, and I have some homemade beef broth that I make with uh, like neck bones and all. I put that in there, and then pressure can it, put it on the shelf, and mm -hmm. there it stays until I need to use it and then replace it. But um, keep a lot of deer meat, and it's it's you know hunted deer. It's just been processed, and then I just take all the uh, ground home, and I just put it in the jars. Um, wow. And it's it's great. It's convenient. It's healthy. It's good. Good stuff. So. And then as far as, like, gardening, which we didn't even really get into, like, pros, well, not pros and cons. I mean, there's a lot of, lots of pros, in my opinion. I love gardening. I love, I mean, just growing stuff and plants and stuff like that. But, um I will say, and I think I've said this in previous episodes, but like the seeds that you get, make sure that you're picky about what seeds that you get. Cause I know mm. that like really good seeds are kind of hard to come by. So just they going, to, you know, a store down the street, it's kind of iffy as to like if it's actually coming from like a, a good place. Yeah. If you have, um, if you have the wherewithal to, and the space to have your own garden, mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend uh, trying to source heirloom seeds. Those are the type of seeds that uh, are, are generational. Um, they've been around for hundreds of years from the same strain, and they're pure seeds. Uh, they're they're not laced with GMOs or any of that nonsense. Um, and one of the other things to to do if you're going to garden is to learn how to keep seed. That means basically taking some of your harvest, letting it. Um, letting it grow past the point of being ripe to eat and letting the seeds mature and then harvesting those seeds, preparing and then storing them for the next season. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the big arts of gardening is keeping those seeds and, and keeping the same plants going year in and year out. And that's something I still haven't mastered, you know, even in the amount of time that I've been gardening and I grew up around farming and gardening and livestock and I, I've got a head start ahead of most folks. Um, but it's still very challenging, um, very rewarding, challenging for sure. Why? So why is it so challenging? Uh, because if you don't do, if you don't do it just right, or you don't let the uh, particular vegetable or fruit ripen uh, to the right point, the seeds mm -hmm. could fail and they won't germinate the next season. Um, I had black beauty zucchini that I tried, um, keeping seed from, it was like the best harvest I ever had. I'm like, I'm keeping these seeds and I let some of them get huge. They get big, they get like yellow and massive and the yeah. seeds are huge. I harvested the seeds, dried them out, put them in a jar. Everything was kosher. Not a single one of them germinated when I tried to store them the next year. Uh, so yeah. that was very disappointing. Um, but gardening's very relaxing and it's it's extremely rewarding when you can reap that harvest and you know exactly where everything that you're eating came from it's yeah. an amazing feeling um well especially when the government's trying to poison us with all kinds of stuff in, in our food yeah you got it but yeah. food food preps i mean this is practical a practical outlook on food preparations and I mean, you're not talking like doomsday preppers where you know you got a year's worth of food I mean, like, it's hard for anybody to have a year's worth of food. It's that's a lot of food. Yeah, uh, I can I can feed my family for about four, maybe six months if we really stretch and ration stuff right now, mm -hmm. if I had to. And I mean, that's that's huge for me. Yeah. That's a long time. And given given the state of modern society, the chances of something happening uh, that would require us to kind of go back to archaic ways. It's, it's kind of few and far between, really. But, I mean, the possibility of it happening, World War Three. I mean, nuclear yeah. warfare, and it's like, it, it's never been more, you know, more... Um, like right around the corner. Possible, yeah, yeah. yeah. Possible than now, just with everything going on. It's just crazy. The world's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, on that note, before we wrap up, I want to read the review from Listener of the Week. And I do appreciate you guys all leaving reviews on uh, iTunes. We had another one as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, as soon as we get 10 reviews, we are going to pick a lucky winner to win a prize pack. This listener of the week is from 22 Cheapster. Five stars titled Shot Show 2024. 
first, I'd like to say that even with all the noise and commotion of SHOT Show going on around, the podcast was only affected a little in sound quality, which is huge considering the environment. Most praise goes to Ava and her incredible interview skills. She has this amazing skill she has continually cultivated that makes her guests comfortable and talkative. She makes guests do a double take with her in-depth knowledge of firearms and use of firearms. Great episode. And actually, you can thank Chad for that because he was the one who recorded that segment that took place at SHOT Show, which we were all just, remember, we were like, I don't know how this show's going to come out because, you know, there was a lot of noise. But then there was like some guy like in the booth next to us playing some instrument out of nowhere. And I'm like, why is this guy playing this instrument right now? Like we, this is not gun related. Ava, it was a country music concert in the booth next to us over at like agency. I mean, I was like, like what literally a country on? music concert. Yeah, I know. It was, yeah. I was actually surprised by how well the audio came out. I'm um, doing so. this and looking at you going, Mm-mm. I know. And no, I'm just trying to be know. like, I know you're, you're making that face to me and I'm just like, I'm just going to act like I don't see that right now. Just act normal. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I will say last episode too, my audio was weird, which I'm like, what happened? So hopefully this episode, the audio sounds a lot better, but I do appreciate you guys being patient with us and continuing to listen to the show. I do feel very confident that it's only going to get better. We have some really exciting things to bring your way. So definitely stay tuned. But in the meantime, uh, don't forget to uh, like Pew Pew Panel on YouTube or Facebook and Instagram, just Pew Pew Panel. Um, Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe to any of the channels. And, uh, and then actually Chad, while we're at it and we're asking people to do all this other stuff, um, you are also selling guns, doing some really cool Cerakote work, all of that. Why don't you tell listeners what your company name is and where they can find you? Yep. So my shop is called Argos Ordnance. That's ordnance like bombs, not laws, no I. Yeah. Um, so you can find us at www.argosordnance.com. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Argos Ordnance. And yeah, I do uh, laser work, Cerakote, uh, you know, custom builds, more of a custom shop at this point. Um, but, you know, just trying to make my own thing out here. But yeah, come check us out. Give us a follow. Check out some of the cool Cerakote work I'm putting out. All right. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you next week. See you guys.